How's everyone doing tonight? Everybody eating and good and not and all that good stuff. Uh, good evening, my name is Eric B. Horn and I'm the founder of Eric B. Horn Career and Business Solutions, which is a career management and professional development firm based in Chicago. Um, my overall passion is, is people and helping people navigate through their careers. Having a career is a lot bigger than just having a resume and a cover letter. You need an overall strategy to get to wherever you want to go in your career. And even if you don't have that roadmap, what I like to do is plant the seeds so the discussion that we were having maybe a year or two years before, it will start to, to blossom. Because I always feel that there's a career track for any and everyone that's in this room and I feel that my overall mission is to help as many people as possible get there because I know how it was for me when I first started out in my career. Basically, I was in IT and it got to a point where a major shift happened for me, but that was a blessing in disguise because if it wasn't for that shift, I wouldn't have started my business. So I'm definitely happy to be here, very passionate to talk about diversity and inclusion and also, because I was looking at the questions, this should be a fun and interactive panel, because I know diversity and inclusion is very, very serious, but we're all here to learn, right? So let's kind of keep an open mind and uh, just have fun throughout this overall discussion. Sorry for all the noise in the construction. Let's <laughs> get into it. I've got some questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Let's go ahead and start with um, Eric and Jessica and Tiana. Maybe start with Eric and work our way down. How can people get started with diversity and inclusion initiatives? I think one of the biggest things to, to get started is understand why you want to do it in the first place. I'm big with begin with the end in mind and be, have an open and honest conversation with yourself if you're the one leading the initiative with the uh, C-suite level, because the initiative comes from the top down, so you want to make sure that everyone is on the same page on the reason why you want to have a diversity and inclusion program, initiative, or whatever you want to call it. That, that would be the first thing. Yeah. Um, Tiana, Eric, you both kind of signed up for this one. Uh, to me, inclusive ultimately means, you know, being part as one and being overall accepted. And a lot of times when you're dealing with corporate America, especially when it comes to the culture, there's a certain fit that you need to have to actually survive in the culture, right? And one of my mentors, who's a vice president of an actual culture shaping company, um, he says, based off of the, the, the top companies that he's dealt with, it's kind of, it's not impossible, but if a culture has been established within a company for so long, it's very difficult to shift that culture. You can do all the training, you can do all of the workshops, and you can do all of that. But it's hard to, to, to break through that wall unless you have a strong buy-in from the top or the influential individuals within the organization, buy-in, so to speak, right? But um, to me, because I've been on both sides of the fence where I've consulted companies, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, well, I've consulted companies and they wanted to, you know, get into diversity and inclusion, but for the wrong reasons, right? But also, I worked for a company uh, years ago where they pushed diversity and inclusion, but the representation wasn't right, right? So it was very confusing, and we lost a lot of the, the, the momentum behind it. But once again, for me, inclusion, everybody needs to be heard. Because one thing that I ask of companies, you want a global footprint, right? And nine times out of 10, the company wants some sort of global uh, footprint. So then I asked them, do you really think to get that footprint, you have to work with individuals that look exactly like you? 
And that's a question that they kind of ponder for a minute because if you want to be global, I not have to, but it'll make more sense just from a perspective standpoint to work with someone like you. Some I like people anyway, so I like to just work with people in general, but to be realistic and to be somewhat global, you have to know that you will not work, collaborate uh, with individuals that always look like you. I mean, it, it is what it is. That, that's the key word, being open to having difficult conversations. You know, uh, getting people in the room and someone may say something just because they don't know any better, right? And a lot of times our initial reaction is just to get upset. But from the learner's perspective, kind of take a step back, so why did you say that? Just to gain a better understanding of where that person is, is coming from. Put forth a little bit more effort to understand someone. Now, there are some people out there that you can't have conversations with. I get that. But for the, for the ones that are open to, to having these conversations and to not only project their own agenda, so to speak, but also to take in and to learn, whether it's about another nationality or whatever it is, that starts the process also. And actually, that's something that can happen. It doesn't have to happen in the boardroom. Those type of conversations can happen right now. You know, that I'm big on, hey, what did you mean by that? Let's kind of put this into a, a learning perspective. Because a lot of times people may, like I said, may take offense to something, and the learning opportunity is destroyed once someone would take offense to something. But you have to have a certain mindset to, to get to that point. A lot of us, a lot of people in this room have that mindset, but we are only a small representation of the actual world, right? And it takes those difficult conversations, those learning lessons, uh, one conversation at a time to get to where what we're trying to get to. Uh, to. To piggyback off of what you said, which was a, a great point, um, when it comes to the overall development of, of employees, and I may get some slack in the room if we have some managers in here, but managers need to lean a little bit more on the side of coaching also. And the reason why I say that is if someone is your direct report, overall that's your responsibility. And I'm not saying that you need to coach them on personal things in their lives because they're hopefully they're adults. But take the time out every week for a one-on-one -on -one with each of your employees. And even though you may spend two to three hours a week, you better believe that you're investing in your employee. And investing in your employee makes them feel included because those conversations will not only be work-based, it's, okay, you told me this year you want to be a team lead. Let's kind of set some goals in place and continue to hold that person accountable, right? Because if you keep that person on track, you're gonna win as a, as a manager or a director or whatever happened. But take the time out to develop, you know, real working relationships with your employees you, that shows that you care, and that will be a big retention piece. Because it's so funny, I was just reading uh, the notes from this book, Seven Reasons Why Employees Leave. And the third reason is because the managers aren't coaching their, their employees. If you don't have a half an hour, take 15 minutes. Not 15 minutes, take 10. Take some time out to you know, coach your employees. You, you'll develop a strong rapport strong relationships, and anyone in this room, if you have a strong relationship with your teammates, they'll go to war for you. And that's the type of relationship that you will want. Yeah, it'll take a little bit more time out your day, but you are investing in that direct report. It's not always just about the money and the vacation and the other perks. Sometimes people at the end of the day want to know that they are appreciated, you are pushing for them, and you want them to succeed. Very, very simple. Can I ask a question? Yes. Oh, yes. What's your take on peer-to-peer -peer coaching? Oh, I, I love it. I'm a big component of holding other people accountable, 
and I want people to hold me. I have my mentees hold me accountable also. So, I'll oh, go ahead. So, if you're, you know, equal between your colleagues, but you want to take an opportunity, a coaching opportunity, you're not rich, you, you care about your colleagues, you want to help them, you're not sure how they're going to receive it, um, what are some, like, best practices or ways you can approach a colleague uh, just to be able to share your insights and just kind of leave it open? It's, you know, it's, it's here if you want it, here if you don't, but... Actually, you kind of said it. If I lead with, hey, I want you to win, and I see some things that I would like to bring to your attention, not to scold you or look down on you, but if, if you implement some of the things that I see, you'll win. So definitely start with, you want to see them succeed, then you can give that feedback. A lot of times people just give feedback and really just leave it as is. Sometimes people's opinion, you really don't want to hear what they have to say, but if you lead with the, hey, I see that you're doing a good job, and, and also, if I know what your goals are based off of the discussions that we have, that can add more, I don't want to use the word leverage, but add more meat to the conversation. Hey, you said you want to be this team lead, but hey, I see you coming in late three times out the week. Hey, what can I do to help you to stay on track? You know, that feedback, but you always lead with the, 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 hey, I want you to win, I want you to succeed, I want you to get that promotion. Because if they hear that first, their guard comes down. It, it depends on the type of relationship that you have with the overall team, right? Of course, from a manager's perspective, a lot of people look at it like, okay, I have to sit in this room and listen. If you as the manager or the director create an overall team environment, and that means also the direct reports holding the manager or the director accountable also, because at the end of the day, you're gonna win as a team or you're gonna lose as a team. So there's no, big eyes and little use when it comes to the overall team development. So if you create that type of space and always lead with the, hey, I want you to, to succeed, maybe you can do this, 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 and this. People in sports do it all the time because their goal is the championship. And if there's something that you can tell me that I can do better to win that championship, you better believe I'm gonna listen. Not everybody's willing to take that advice, but the individuals that are, those are the ones that you want to develop those core relationships. So peer to peer, I'm all for it. If I'm messing up in my business, I need you to tell me, especially if you know what my triggers are. For example, my triggers are my wife and my child. So if you say, hey, I really need you to get these three clients because of London, that's her name, London, because of London, okay, let's go. So, but some people may not take it, but stick with the people that, that do. Those are the individuals that you develop those strong relationships with. You'll be able to receive that feedback a lot better and you can move forward. Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, one is just to have a, a genuine curiosity for, once again, someone that doesn't look like you. Uh, I'll give a prime example. Uh, there's a lot of women empowerment groups, women business groups, which I'm, I'm all for, right? But um, I had a certain level of, of ignorance. And I mean, I can say this, right? What, what stays what stay in this room stays in this room. I'll have everybody, I have everybody sign an NDA before we leave. But um, when it came to the concept of the women empowerment groups, I felt not excluded, but um, it was to the point where I had to have one of my friends who's a, she's, she's a woman and she's like one of like huge when it comes to women empowerment. She, I had to have a real conversation with her and say, well, you know, and, and I know that this is your thing and I'm all for it and I love what you guys are doing, but you know, can I come to the events and come support and things of that nature? And after she, like laughed for about 20 seconds. She was like, sure, just because it's a, a women-oriented group doesn't necessarily mean that we're trying to exclude men, in a sense, right? 
but that was my level of thinking. I don't want to interrupt the thing that you guys have going on. And she said that that's the, the mindset that I don't want you to have, right? Because even though these women groups, once again, which I love, are thriving and showing empowerment, they're still big on collaboration and, you know, women and men need each other when it comes to these groups, right? So I think, you know, being curious and even saying that even though I may not look like you, can I attend this event so I can meet individuals? Just having that curious mindset will open up the doors for having these open and, and honest conversations. So definitely having that curiosity to say, even though I am not X, Y, and Z, I would still like to come out. Because at the end of the day, I want to come out to support. And she had to pull that out of me. She was like, well, why do you want to go? Because I want to support you. So don't, if you want to support, that's a lot bigger than you not being a woman. If that makes any sense. Yeah, to, to, that was really good. Uh, but yeah, to, but to piggyback and also know that when you come to the conversation, you're not going to have all the answers. There are going to be some, some, some gaps in, in your thought process, which is, which is fine, right? Um, even major diversity and inclusion um, professionals, they don't still don't have all the answers, right? Um, more people do need to come to the table because nine times out of ten, you're thinking it. You're thinking it, regardless if it's what you see on the news or, you know, a lot of challenges that certain groups are having. You're seeing it, so the thoughts are there, but you just got to push forward and, and, and talk about it, right? But talk about it, like you said, in a, in a safe space because you don't want to to muster up the courage to come to something and then state your opinion and then feel like you have a bullseye on your back. And in some instances, in some companies, that, that does happen, right? But the reason that that does happen is because the overall reason why a company wanted to start some sort of diversity and inclusion um, representation was all for the for the wrong reasons now I can talk it's one of the questions that you're gonna ask but let me just go into it right now so now from a confidentiality standpoint I can't say the company's name so bear with me but a company brought me in just to have a discussion because they wanted to start having diversity and inclusion initiatives and just like the first question that was asked today I asked them what's the overall reason and the reason was because their competitors are doing it. Totally off the mark. Because diversity and inclusion, you're dealing with people, and it's not a trend. It's, some, it's something that's not going to end in the next five to 10 to 15 years. This is here to stay. But with their overall initiative to have it is just to make sure they still have some sort of competitive advantage is for all the, the, the wrong reasons, so to speak, right? So, just like you, I just lost my, 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 my train of thought. But go in with it with a, a genuine reason why. And the genuine reason is the individuals that sit next to you, in front of you, and behind you. It's about people. Everybody wants to feel included. Everyone wants to feel successful. That's going to take hard conversations. That's going to take open and honest conversations. It is going to take a high level of vulnerability also. But when you have these conversations, you want to make sure that once you leave, one, you've been heard, two, the information that's been written down goes somewhere, and three, it's, it's overall implemented, right? Because the implementation piece is going to be the biggest piece. Once again, talking to my mentor about culture shaping, he tells me it takes Okay, you have all heard of the, it takes 30 days for someone to develop a habit. Okay, for me it's 60, especially when it comes to working out, but that's another situation. But for a company to shift, it takes three to seven years, which is a long period of time. So you don't want to go into something like diversity and inclusion for the wrong reasons, 
because the effort and the energy that you put into it may not see the, the overall light of day, culture-wide, company-wide, if, if that makes sense to everyone. By the question, do you mean, are you asking what the, Are there any immediate concerns about a shift to diversity of thought away from visible diversity um, and the typical diversity measures that companies are used to addressing and measuring? We'll try to answer that. I think the biggest concern for me is that regardless if it's the, the thought or the, the physical piece, that the overall momentum will stop, right? Rome wasn't built in a day, the earth wasn't created in a day. So when it comes to diversity and inclusion, there's more movement behind it, but you know, we're just getting started. Overall, it's about understanding the differences in people. That's occurred since the beginning of the time, right? And instead of straying away from it, like a lot of people do, because once again, we led this conversation to saying, okay, diversity and inclusion is a serious topic, but it, it still needs to be discussed. It's no telling the conversations that will occur after this panel. Um, I hope there's a lot of conversation, a lot of conversation with people who are, don't look like each other. to so once again, gain more understanding to say, okay, we are different, but that's okay because let's try to find a common ground. One thing that I love to say, I don't care who I meet or how different that they are, you better believe I can find a common ground. And once I find that common ground, that is going to be the anchor to even have more discussions, more of even the, the harder discussions because I can lead with the common ground that, that, that we both have. But if, those, if we tend to stray away from those conversations, eventually that momentum is gonna stop. And once that momentum stops, issues are gonna pop up like weeds, so to speak, right? So as long as we continue to have those conversations, some light, some hard, but always trying to gain a better understanding of how, once again, we may be different, but we're, we're the same in some way, shape, or form. If those conversations stop, I'm gonna be very worried because it's always about forward movement as opposed to stopping and then going back. Did I answer the question? Pause. I, if there's okay. no, just to, to add,